Bienvenidos al capítulo 18, de hecho, hablemos sobre fotografía. Una noche que yo estimo va a ser eh, fantástica, va a, a haber eh, una experiencia eh, de vida alrededor de la fotografía y del arte. Eh, ya platicaremos con Maxims en algunos minutitos, pero no perdamos tiempo. Eh, muchas gracias a el maestro eh, Gabriel, que, eh, que después de esa pérdida del video que tuvimos contigo, no puedo verte a los ojos, maestro. No sabes cómo me, me da pena y vergüenza que se haya perdido uno de los mejores capítulos de la corta existencia de Charlemos sobre fotografía. Pero bienvenido a presentar tu libro favorito. Estamos inquietísimos por saber cuál es. Bienvenido, maestro. Pues hola, muy buenas noches a todos. Eh, yo soy Gabriel Marín. Tengo un pequeño taller que se llama El Tercio, Espacio Fotográfico. Y me dedico principalmente a investigar, difundir y realizar procesos históricos de fotografía. Y bueno, eh, muchas gracias, Michelle, por la invitación. Y es muy complicado recomendar o decir qué libro es el de mis favoritos, ¿no? Porque la lista es gigantesca y cabe aclarar que soy un enfermo obsesionado de ir a las librerías y, y disfrutar eh, libros, este... Pues de, de fotos principalmente, ¿no? Pero bueno, yo creo que ante esta temporada pandémica, eh, esta temporada de crisis, esta temporada eh, donde la brújula recorre un lado y el otro, eh, es buen momento para hacer una pausa, para reflexionar y sobre todo para darnos cuenta de la magia que existe en la vida. Simplemente hace falta como detenerse, abrir los ojos y ver toda la poética que hay en la luz y en las cosas cotidianas. Y entonces decidí que el libro que voy a presentar el día de hoy va a ser de uno de los fotógrafos más importantes, no solamente de México, América Latina, sino del mundo, y que es el maestro Carlos Curado que partió de este mundo terrenal aproximadamente hace como nueve meses, diez meses, un año, algo así. Y él sacó el libro que se llama El arte de apreciación de las imágenes. Es este libro que se realizó también en homenaje, lo editó la Universidad Veracruzana y lo hizo cuando le entregaron el honoris causa como artista, ¿no? Y bueno, pues este libro nos presenta una poética, una reflexión sobre el amor, sobre la vida, y sobre todo, pues la magia de lo cotidiano. ¿no? Y nos regresa un poquito a ver la fotografía desde la manera más primitiva, que es desde la construcción de pequeñitas cajas de cartón para hacer cámaras estenopeicas. Y a partir de este tipo de mecanismos, generar todo un universo. A veces me preguntan que cuál es la cámara eh, que recomiendo cuál es el, el, el mejor lente, ¿no? ¿Cuál, cuál cámara está de moda. Y todas mis respuestas, siempre mi respuesta va a ser la cámara estenopeica, ¿no? La cámara estenopeica nos brinda como de principios básicos que yo considero que todo fotógrafo, al menos una vez en la vida, debe de tener como esta experiencia y esta magia de adentrarse con un cúter, con cartón, diseñar una cámara, darle el formato que tú quieras y eh, inventar eh, universos con esto, ¿no? Entonces, el día de hoy, Michelle, quiero, quiero recomendarles ¿no? a Carlos Curado. Hay algunos videos en YouTube que hablan de su obra. 
y, y déjense fascinar por este encantador mundo de lo estenopeico. Oye, qué joya, querido eh, Gabriel. Eh, dices algo muy bonito y que ahora lo retomaremos con Maxims, que tiene que ver con la reflexión eh, de lo cotidiano, de mirar. Eh, ¿Todo el trabajo de este libro de Carlos es con eh, cámara estenopeica? Todo el trabajo fotográfico de Carlos Jurado es 100% estenopeico, ¿no? Carlos, con él, él de formación, es un artista plástico, eh, se dedica más a hacer pintura, y a partir de un ejercicio que le dejan a su hija en la primaria, de construir una cámara estenopeica con una caja de zapatos, ¿no? él empieza a enloquecer y empieza a llenar su casa de cajas y empieza a construir cámaras cada vez más elaboradas, cámaras fotográficas, también construye cámaras de cine, ¿no? Y a partir de ahí empieza un, un redescubrimiento de la imagen a partir de un pequeño hoyito que le llaman este no. ¿no? Entonces, te digo que se me hace en este momento de la vida en particular fascinante poder como tener este tipo de, de ejercicios que pueden ser de un ejercicios muy caseros, pueden construir sus cámaras estenopeicas con pequeños botecitos de frijoles, ¿no? Sí, 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 sí. Y adentrarse en este fascinante mundo. Qué maravilla, maestro. Eh, ¿Carlos Jurado hacía eh, impresión en Palladio Platino o estoy confundido? Pues Carlos Jurado hacía impresión en varias técnicas también primigenias, ¿no? Hacía impresiones en cianotipia, ¿no? Hacía gomas bicromatadas. Hacía también otro proceso que él lo bautizó como adicromo. Lo que hacía es generar color, ¿no? Bajo principios de hacer separaciones tonales, ¿no? A partir de diferentes negativos con filtros. Después con fécula de papa daba, eh, eh, digamos, lo, lo más semejante a un grano e imprimía como imágenes en en soportes este, de papeles de algodón, ¿no? También hizo mucha experimentación con serigrafía, ¿no? Entonces fue un artista que revolucionó su época. Y a partir de cajitas de cartón, ¿no? Que eso es como lo más, lo más increíble de, de todo esto. Wow, ¡Qué chido! ¡Qué chido! Muchísimas gracias, querido eh, eh, maestro Gabriel. Eh, si alguien, eh, como son bien prendidos, si alguien puede anotar el nombre, bueno, el nombre del libro es El arte ¿Sí? y la apreciación de las imágenes. El arte de la presión de las imágenes. ¿no? Fantástico. De todos modos, yo te mando unas fotitos para que se los compartas a, 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 tus, a tus camaradas, ¿no? El arte de la presión de las imágenes. Chidísimo. Muchas gracias, querido ¿No? maestro. Pues... Ya saben, otra maravilla para mirar eh, desde la experiencia de aprender a mirar. Eh, eh, oigan, rapidísimo, eh, los proyectos me escribieron que ya algunos están editando, que no lo han terminado. Algunas otras personas ya enviaron su primer video. Eh, solo decirles que el primer video se publica la siguiente semana, el próximo miércoles. Y en cuanto se publica el primer video, ya nadie puede participar. Entonces, si a alguien le falta editar algo, tiene de aquí al próximo martes para terminar su videíto y entregarlo. Eh, la agenda de, los, de la presentación de los portafolios se envía la siguiente semana y ya sabrán la fecha en que les toca a cada uno la, su pequeña presentación. Bueno. Eh, pues, pues bueno, Michelle, eh, muchas gracias por tu invitación de compartir un libro, ¿no? Y quiero robarte medio minuto. Para los que tengan tuyos. más interés en este tipo de procesos, eh, y para los que estuvieron, los que se perdieron la plática que di con Michelle, este día viernes a las 11 de la mañana, horario de Ciudad de México, la Facultad de Física de la UNAM me invitó a dar una charla a los alumnos, ¿no? Para que platique parte de procesos de fotografía. En especial me voy a clavar con una técnica que se llama colorido húmedo, que son imágenes sobre placas de vidrio y aluminio, entonces mi departamento se convertirá uh, en un cuarto oscuro y empezaremos como a realizar imágenes de una manera este, remota, imágenes químicas, ¿no? Entonces, pues ahí les dejo la invitación, te mando el cartelito si me puedes ayudar a compartirlo, no tiene ningún costo, solamente tienen que registrarse. 
Oye, y la, la charla va enfocado a, a física, física fotográfica, ¿no? La, la comparto con toda eh, la comunidad de Charlemos sobre fotografía. Muchas gracias, querido maestro. Muchas gracias. Uh, and I switch to English. Um, I have to say before uh, Gabriel, go, uh, Gabriel leaves, um, he is uh, one of the best uh, uh, printers, should I say, uh, here in Mexico. I studied with him some uh, antique techniques. Um, I have printed with him a lot of tests and he was like one of my best teachers. So if, if you want to try more printers, <laughs> you should try something with Gabriel. He's in Mexico City, uh, Maxims. Well, welcome to Charlemos sobre Fotografía in English. Uh, it's uh, an amazing, an amazing uh, moment because um, I met this guy, Maxims, uh, this guy, just in the street. He was walking with a big box, well, uh, a big box on a tripod. And he was, uh, it was in his shoulder, but it was a very big box, you know, a very big. And I was very curious and I said, just, excuse me, what do you have there? And then we became friends, may I say. Uh, Maxims, welcome to Guadalajara. Welcome to Mexico. Welcome to Charlemos sobre Fotografía. Um, I would like to know who is this guy, Maxims, that walks around Guadalajara with a big box uh, trying to make some interesting pictures? Um, hi, and thank you very much uh, for, um, for uh, inviting me. Um, before I really start, I, I really liked the, the story of, uh, of Gabriel, and uh, I had to smile a lot because I understood a lot of stuff in Spanish. Um, and because I also felt like, well, I understand this, uh, this, this, this artist and I, should, I still need to note the name because that was a difficult one for me. Um, about me, really short, um, I was born in Latvia. Uh, I moved to the Netherlands uh, after the Soviet Union uh, fell apart uh, with my mother and I studied there. I, uh, I spent 24 years in the Netherlands and I moved to Mexico just uh, well, half a year ago. And uh, the reason for that is because my wife is Mexican and we have decided to go here instead of trying and trying again in the Netherlands. It's kind of hard there uh, in terms of rules. Uh, and in terms of um, photography or maybe a, more of an artisan explanation, I think it all came because um, when I went from Latvia to the Netherlands, everything was different. The, my point of view was uh, formed in the, in the Soviet Union, basically still. Then it was a bit of Latvia, it was a bit of independent country. And I moved to the Netherlands and it's a different thing all over again. So my best guess is that um, Part of my uh, artistic development started there because my point of view was so different every time. And I had to adapt. I had to find you know, a way to deal with that. And uh, I guess that's just you know, the start. So maybe um, before I go really deep, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll switch back to... Um, The guy who's walking in Guadalajara with a big box you know, over his shoulder. <laughs> yes. Who is this guy? Who is this guy who, who likes to, um, to make pictures all around Guadalajara with a big box? Well, um, that is processed. I really need uh, to be part of the picture. I need to uh, be part of the image. I need to prefer the reality over the image in the end, even though I really love photography and light uh, and not just photography but like images and, and I because I know this is a very interesting thing in terms of philosophy and and metaphysics even and so interesting to go into the images but don't forget reality and that's why I really I built this thing uh, so that way <laughs> uh, I built it to become 
more part of the process and I didn't want to go back to the analog so uh, maybe I should just get get it over with with this camera uh, but you know it's basically a, a box very simple two lenses uh, there's no a prism there I, th I think I read something about a prism yeah sorry on the, uh, but that's uh, I mean it it depends how you explain it but it's basically Fresnel lens times two and that forms a, a bright image on the back and that image is uh, well probably it's larger than most people uh, have their laptops right now they're open uh, so your screen is maybe what it's like 17 inch uh, diagonal it's it's bigger than that and what it allows me to do is basically take a scanner and use my hand and just scan the image but if I stop halfway and go back I get a mirrored image or so you would think it's not a mirrored image at all because now maybe I have moved a little bit so um, my shutter is not there anymore uh, it's basically a, a line scanner that I'm dragging along the uh, along the, the the back screen and this this idea came from uh, basically one of the biggest inspirations was Ulai. So maybe you know uh, Marina Abramovic and Ulai, but Ulai uh, by himself did a lot of photography. And at some point he built a huge camera, uh, way, way bigger than this one. And he was inside of the camera and he was literally moving his hand throughout the, the chemistry of the, of the film. And in that way manipulating the image. So I, I, I really thought that was cool because he was manipulating the image still within the realm of the light. So it wasn't a post-process. It was not a, a thing uh, digitally. Uh, I have done a lot of that, but I became more and more obsessed with this. Well, I need to slow down. I need to actually slow other people down as well because I was teaching and my students were like they weren't looking that was the main problem of, uh, of, 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 of teaching is that how to make them look, how to slow them down. So with this camera, I guess I could, so I can, uh, this is a very simple thing. This is a diaphragm. So I'm going to open it up. So first you can see barely an image of the lamps behind me, right? And I also needed to control the light, even with this simple, simple device, I need to control the light somehow because the scanner itself has a very, very uh, limited uh, dynamic range. So basically the, the hole that I cut out, I, I saved the, uh, the material and then I started basically cutting rings out of it. And one by one you can go and open it up or you can just remove the whole thing <laughs> and there's your diaphragm basically <laughs> did you take any measurement between uh, each diaphragm uh, no th this one actually was a, a, a trial and error uh, um, it took me it took me some time to know to figure out like where the next ring should be placed uh, but there was no measurement unless you you talk about you know the uh, the light meter so what I do is when I have a scene I set up the camera then I need to determine like how much light I need and I just have a um, basically with a marker I put a, a line on a light meter an old school light meter but because uh, the the, the, the computation that you have on the light meter doesn't, doesn't concern me anymore because this thing does, doesn't work that way. And even though I know that this is, uh, uh, this is a 350 millimeter lens, so it is 350 in ultra large format, so you can do some, some calculation, but then now you can see the image way, way better. At least I hope you can see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there you go. I opened up my diaphragm. So now maybe I have, uh, you know, sufficient light for the scanner. 
So when something happens in front of the lens, of course, when the image moves, I can uh, play with that as well. So I really become part of the uh, of the image. I have uh, some some examples for you for the the people who have not seen um, uh, who haven't seen on my my web page. I could show you a thing or two. Before that, uh, let me ask you a question. Um, yeah. Um, the screen. The screen uh, of the camera, what is made of? Uh, is it a prism? Is it a glass? Uh, what is made of? So it is a Fresnel lens, and what I do is I uh, I start I grind them myself. I start uh, grinding them up, and uh, the biggest problem is to actually to find a Fresnel lens that has enough quality. Uh, you've seen some of the pictures that were, uh, you know, like full screen. We were actually pe pixel peeping on an another camera that had a way better screen than this one. Uh, so, and that one was a uh, hundred and thirty dollars actually to buy it, and you had to be then very careful not to scratch it. But you then you have to manually, uh, basically grind your 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 mate. Basically, this is this is a mate. And uh, you could use just a normal piece of glass as well. But the thing is that um, this gives you a bit more light. Uh, so it, it spreads the light more evenly across the, the whole frame. And if you find the right combination, uh, then, then you're a go. I mean, the, the, the image circle uh, that you can produce is quite large. And I don't need to, uh, I mean, I have, uh, I have some technical cameras. I have, I just sold the Technica. I have a Cinar, I have a Plowbell. And the biggest image circle that I, I could manage with those was, uh, uh, was from, um, uh, this was, a, uh, let's see, this is in 13 by 18 size uh, film, Plowbell. And then you, you had a 300 millimeter lens that had a 515 millimeter image circle so that's quite large <laughs> so that one could do something like this but then imagine the weight of that thing yeah, yeah? so you get a top heavy camera and this one is coroplast so it's coroplast aluminium and it's basically uh, it slides in and out so i just i just basically calculated how much I, material i would need to go uh, up to one meter uh, of distance so that's the Minimal focusing distance is one meter, and then it go go to infinity and actually past infinity, which gives very interesting results. There is this photographer, uh, I think he was a Japanese uh, photographer, who did a whole uh, series of um, past infinity f uh, photographs in black and white, and it gives a very different um, unsharpness or bokeh, if you will. Uh, it's a uh, it's a very different thing, but that's that's not the point of this camera. The point is really to be part of the of the deal. And there are other cameras that I've built that are basically uh, are the same principle, where is where there is another camera recording uh, the back screen. But then I really have to work more because then I I cannot just get away with you know putting a a thick uh, piece of cloth here. No, I need to make a, a, a bigger, um, I need to make an extension for the second camera at the right distance. I need to centralize the whole thing. It has to be really uh, like tight and it has to be uh, light. Uh, there should not be uh, any, yes, indeed, that's him, Hiroshi Sugimoto. Uh, thank you. This is cool. Um, I need to make sure there's no light leaks coming in. Uh, so with the scanner that's not really a problem I mean it is a problem if you really allow a lot of light to get in but a little bit is not a problem because uh, the scanner is adapted by the way so you need to adapt the scanner itself uh, to make sure it, it does not uh, have its own light so normally you have the line scanner the line sensor and it's RGB 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 and you also have the RGB 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 light uh, so basically the scanner scans three uh, different lines which are through the three colors and the appropriate color is uh, lit on the on the light and this happens so fast that you know in the end you, 
you just use it for a document, for a color document, and then it's fine. So, but this is a problem for me because uh, the scanner does not realize that now every all the light uh, wavelengths coming are coming in, so all the colors are getting in. So it's um, when the the JPEG is combined, you get basically a black and white image because uh, I cannot use a color filter. Uh, I could, I mean, but then I would end, end up just with one color. And one of the things that I really still want to do, amongst many other other ideas to to work further on this, is to get um, get involved in coding. So I could code the scanner, so it would create me three different uh, images with three different colors, which I then print on transparencies. So now not only I have you know my hand as a as a as a as a paintbrush basically, but also the time in between that I need to switch for a filter for an optical filter of a different color, do a scan and then print those three and then uh, combine them together so to get a color image back again. So imagine what, what happens if, you know, if some time has passed, so somebody was sitting there, now he's not sitting there, or maybe... Uh, this is going to be really interesting, but it, like, it is all about the process, it is all about being part of this... Uh, of experience with light because this thing sometimes makes me just want to look I don't want to make any pictures and that is another uh, aspect of my photography uh, at least for the last three years uh, when I had this um, well you could call it a bit of an epiphany like okay I, I should really like yeah yeah it's something like that because I, I really I became I was shooting way too fast and this this comes back, you know, from being an event photographer and a sports photographer, you know, a, a while ago. But I was shooting way too fast at some point. Um, there is a raised hand. Is that like a question or? Oh, sorry, I didn't pay attention to that. Let me see. Yes, there is a raised hand. Uh, Paco, please. Yes, that's a question, Martin. So nice meeting you first, and thanks thanks for your time. So <clears throat> my question is comes in the way that what happened first the idea of taking the pictures or the camera or the actual camera building the camera was the you know the idea to make the images or it was the other way well in this specific case so uh, when I was looking for more involvement uh, not just you know like uh, I would set up the camera that would already take a long time using technical cameras um, it was the idea first, so the process, as the process uh, necessitated the creation of another camera. I had to think uh, in a different way. I had to think like, okay, I cannot use a normal camera on the back of, of this thing again. I need to do something else. Uh, then I came uh, across the work of Ulai, and there was another work that, uh, this is another, this is a Dutch photographer, uh, a woman who used just basically uh, she opened up a flatbed scanner and that was it, you know, and uh, what, what came out of that were a lot of colors, a lot of different things and uh, her process was a bit different than mine and the way she used the scanner was different than mine, but it gave me the idea like, well, now we have a different scanner, I could maybe, uh, uh, you know, approach it from that uh, point of view. And actually, one of the things that I also still wanted to, you know, uh, ask uh, Gabriel at some point is that maybe there's still a positive uh, um, film available in really large sizes because that would be awesome for this thing as well. Um, I couldn't get to that, but I wanted to have a really lifelike image at that point. I wanted to be part of it. And when I, when I gave up on the film I, uh, aspect, I thought, well, then why not look forward so I can, you know, go digital. But then the only option I have right now is to go black and white as well. For me, it's really interesting, um, this idea of uh, having a, a revelation moment, you know, where a catharsis, you said. Um, um, but there's always like a feeling of... Uh, paying attention to things 
to to stop doing whatever you are doing to be in this uh, accelerator uh, rhythm very fast rhythm i mean and then you have to stop and then to start paying attention to things this cathartic moment uh, came from doing sports photojournalism and things that ha that need to be very very fast and then just started to pay attention to things how is this experience why did you came did you came back to 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 to, to observation the thing is that um when you are looking around you without a camera and photographers they they will uh, recognize this uh, you usually end up seeing something very interesting with your own eyes, you know, and you just observe the moment. You just observe, you know, like, uh, let's say there is a, uh, there is some sun shining through the window and there is a, a tree outside and that filters the light uh, that creates some shadows moving on your wall, right? So that experience alone can be very, very satisfying and can be very, you know, s slowing you down. And uh, so when I started this, this conversation, I told you like my, I had to like switch my points of view a lot uh, when I came here and I never stopped doing that. Uh, so I started like really, I was really curious, like how is this possible that when I look at those things, when I look at light from certain, you know, sources certain experience like sensory experience you know how is that possible that i am so amazed so you know stupefied you know like i'm like wow this is beautiful this is awesome you know this is amazing you know and time stops and this is something yet you know you would you would you would experience in uh you know, in, in flow, in different forms of flow. So you could talk about doing sports. You could experience that as a, as a, as a person who's doing sports. Time disappears. You just go and go on, go on, go on until you're done, until you're like really tired. Same thing happens with creativity and same thing happens with beauty. And it's a very interesting neurological process. And when I started exploring this, at some point, you know, this was quite early in this in this uh, exploration. I would say there was a lot of uh, different parts of information that didn't make sense. It was all over the place, and I was just finishing, you know, uh, teaching at Saint Lucas in a, at a school in the Netherlands, and I I just I was in a train, and I was looking outside, and I and I suddenly had this epiphany. I started writing. I had a I had a book with me. I always have this thing with me, uh, just to write down ideas. And uh, I ended up writing a lot, and that became a photographic manifesto. So I wouldn't say that there was a specific one moment of catharsis for me, unless you would count the moment that you know this, all these thoughts came out of the, on the paper. So if you're talking about just one moment that was there in the train, you know, I was just, I saw, I just, I just saw the scenery passing by. Everybody else was on their phone already. You know, this was this time already. Nobody's looking out of the window anymore. They're just like this. And I was like, why is that? And then there were already, there was already a lot of information on why that was. And there was a lot of frustration uh, at my end as well, because I, I saw that, you know, that this is a really bad thing. Technology is a good thing, but it's a very bad thing when you don't know how to deal with it the right way. It, uh, it seems like being like a human posture or like spiritual posture or life posture. I'm not sure the word of posture. What is that? Like a... Uh, postura? Alguien me ayuda con la traducción de postura? So a poster like a thing no. on the wall or? No, like a stance. Oh, posture. Posture. Yeah. Yes. Um, I have. Has, has anybody read? Uh, has anybody read uh, Susan Sontag, for example, the, uh, on photography? At some point, she is saying that you know, like you have. Um, 
photography is is actually creating its own reality its own uh it's maybe people are preferring photography you know to reality and then you know, we have for example Baudrillard you know the french philosopher who says basically well we already passed that we already have created uh, uh basically a copy of reality which is uh you know you see that in cinema and photography and it can do two things. It can be great for us. It can be very bad for us. And the uh, the approach matters. And the approach matters because you need to know what's going on with your brain when you look at all those images. And it's not just the volume, but it is, can you read an image? Can you really, um, uh, can you understand what is actually going on, you know, when you see something and not not just in real life, but like with images, you have that. And there's another thing she's she's saying, she's saying like, well, uh, a photograph is not telling you more, you know, than uh, than words could could, you know, it, it de depends when you are when you're an expressive person, when you're a poet, for example, and you could make a picture that speaks a thousand words. But for a normal person, that is not the case. Basically, you would say like we have this very tiny uh, uh, amount of information out of the ever, everything else. So you, you cancel out the context. There's a lot of aspects to this. And once again, I really love photography. I really love images. But I also wanted to know what, what is happening with people when they see so much images. What is happening to them? When I see this this reality presented by the news, I, I I've also given some uh, 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 some lessons on that. So in in the Netherlands, I was doing ENG, the electronic news gathering uh, classes, and you had storytelling, and basically you're creating your own reality there. And then, then all of a sudden, it hit me as well. It's like, oh shit! I I came from the Soviet Union. And when I was like eight or nine or ten, I'm not even sure what, when that was, but the Soviet Union stopped. And then all of a sudden I was like, well, this was a lie. That was a lie. That was a lie. And it just wouldn't stop. And I came to the Netherlands and then it's like, well, they have a very different point of view and everything on history as well. And it's like, but this is not what I've been taught at school. So my history is wrong or their history is wrong. What the hell is going on? So all these things, uh, you started with Susan Sontag. Uh, I, there is also another really cool thing, uh, Walton. Anybody heard of that name? Uh, Walton is a, is a philosopher who wrote about photographic realism. And this is one of my f most favorite subjects because it is talking about the difference uh, between a painting and a, and a, uh, and a photographic uh, image, so an image with photographic uh, realism or lens based, uh, lens based uh, media. So it's Walton, W A L T O N, uh, and it is. Uh, there are a couple of things you could find online, and it is on photographic realism. Um, what he basically is talking about is like how the, our own mind plays a trick on us uh, with. Uh, when we see something that is produced by a camera, we instinctively believe that is true. So this is a, a really, you know, in our day and age, it's a very dangerous thing as well. Uh, but again, images are really cool thing because it's also a mirror for us. It is a way to see the tiniest things, you know, uh, in, in the universe and also the biggest things in the universe. Uh, so it is like the extension of light for me. So I, I, I really want to teach people like, well, this is an image, you know, like this is what it does to your head and this is how to read it. Now go and enjoy it because now you can actually enjoy it better, not just, you know, uh, by um, knowing that it cannot do you any, any harm, but also like appreciate it even more because it is after all it is also light and light is another thing it's like it's this this i guess i should stop here you know because maybe maybe there's another question or something but that's another that's a whole different aspect of of this whole story but it's big as well what about the tension what one of the 
the big part of your manifesto talk about an uh, talk about attention to life you bring yes. attention to life you can feel free you can feel uh, no censorship uh, and you can flow what, what is all the what is that so uh, the manifesto is really non-political it is really about uh, it is something I wrote for myself I guess at first but when I was writing it I thought well this is you know this is coming out to be something more of a statement and uh, and once again, there was a, a really big influence of, of my students in that time uh, who were basically, you know, they were living through their screens, but they were not living in, you know, in the reality. And um, going back to the attention, uh, basically it's a, it's a process of how we translate whatever is coming into the, our eyes the you know how we translate those patterns those colors uh into information and then how to you know how to how we filter what is what is interesting for us and what is not interesting for us there's another a very interesting thing to it as well uh before i go on about it um when you make a photograph when you make a you know a, a moving image you make a scene you always think about you no know, uh, where does the attention go first? Where where does it go to the next part? You know where like it travels along the frame from one place to another, and basically with one frame you can already create a story, right? Yeah. That's how our eyes work as well. So we pick up on something at first in real life, and then slowly but surely we can analyze this if we take the time. So taking the time is key, but also another thing is knowing, you know, again, what happens when you just had too much, you know, so that's, that was about, you know, slowing down. It was about limited amount of uh, pictures that I could make. So any scene that I would see, I, I may only make three images, not more than that. Um, if I do, I'm breaking the rules. Same thing with, you know, be doing all that, uh, doing everything that I want to do with an image on scene, not afterwards on a computer, because it was about light as well. And the attention mechanism is basically the key to this whole. Why? Um, it allows you to process an image in a different way, in this very thorough way. And when you do this, uh, for example, if you if you take you know uh, if you look at an image that is uh, uh, very straightforward, you know, uh, no technical sorcery there, nothing. Yes, that's Walton. Um, or you take an image where you just go completely crazy with, you know, with uh, colored lights, you know, you go with, you know, special techniques, you go with movement, do whatever you want. The idea is how do I analyze this image? in the best way possible. Think of this. If you're watching a movie, right? And you're watching this masterpiece by Kubrick or Tarkovsky or something, you know? And you go back and you think, wow, that was amazing. But now I have to look at it three or four times before I catch all the aspects of it. Because the, the time and the work that goes into image, each image, it's, it's there and it's for a reason. And we pick up on this subconsciously and we might get it wrong if if our attention mechanism is not working properly so when you realize this and you start you know like be, being careful about analyzing images uh it's a very interesting thing because it goes into um this analysis and i'm not again i'm not talking about politics right now i'm talking about uh self-knowledge why am i seeing this why am i interpreting something in the way that I am interpreting it. You look at an image, you know, for 10 seconds, you know, may, no, not just 10 seconds, let's make it two seconds. And then somebody asks you, what did you see? And you say, well, there's a, there's a scene happening, this is happening. In two seconds, you can, you can tell me exactly what you have seen. Then the same image comes back, you, now you have 20 minutes to analyze it. And now somebody's telling you like, okay, only observations, you cannot interpret anything. So you start with shapes, you start, you know, with uh, with one thing is bigger than the other, 
you know, uh, but you don't say that it's closer to the camera because that's already an interpretation, right? So you see there is a big difference. Once you start doing that, you go into the Plato's cave. You actually, you escape out of the Plato's cave. Why am I saying that? Uh, remember Susan, she also wrote this. She also saw, uh, wrote that, you know, uh, images they you know they 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 frame things and they that means everything else is deleted it's out of the picture it's not there anymore right so in terms of reality we have a very limited uh, idea of that reality now think of the the uh, the shadows in the in the cave of, of Plato uh, Plato's allegory as a shadow they give us limited information we cannot see, uh, we, we can only see that they're basically shadows and they're, they're not reality once we escape it. So, when you start realizing this, you start realizing this, okay, so now I can actually, actually read uh, an image in a more critical way. But it gets still more interesting because we already talked about Baudrillard. Uh, I'll get that name in the, in the chat as well. Uh, you're talking about Simulacra. So simulacra is maybe something that people have heard. It's basically where you have the copy of the reality and then the copy becomes the preference. It becomes the... Uh, now you're acting towards the copy, right? And this is another thing. If we see an ideal image, we try to become that ideal image. It's a psychological... Uh, um, you know, it's, it's the way our brains work, basically. Um, so now the past that was recorded by a camera becomes the future because now you see, if you see those images um, uh, many, many times, then there is a, there's another thing, Fiona, Fiona something, Fiona, I'll get back to you on that one. She's uh, into neurology of beauty. And what, what, is, what is going on, like everybody knows throughout history, uh, the, the, uh, standards of beauty change, right? Why is that? Because of repetition of images. So that means that if you show something often enough, our brains uh, have a preference for that later on. So with, with this right now, you can also think, okay, we have uh, the digital uh, photography. And for many people, it means I need to have the image as, you know, as sharp as possible, as clear as possible, as, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do with that, that's fine. But there are also a lot of Photoshop, so now you can idealize a lot of things. And this becomes the new beauty standard. And later on you see this on the street because, you know, there's going to be more makeup on a, on a girl because she's seen, you know, somebody on a magazine she didn't have anything, you know, like the skin was perfect, right? So this causes a lot of uh, psychological problems as well. Um, but that's another story. Cool, okay. There's, I sense there's a question. Yes, I have a question. There's a lot of uh, people in this community that are uh, just starting the, their work, their project, their, their, their future as artists, as photographers. Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest questions is how, uh, how much do they have to trust in beauty standards? Do they have to, to, to work with these beauty standards or do they have to work in their personal, uh, in their personal sign? Allow, allow yourself to do both because this is very important. You don't have to choose a side. You, you really have to uh, take things your own way. If you want to idealize, do that. That's fine. You know, you just realize that there are, there are a lot of things behind that. If you want to go your own way, that's also fine. The, the main thing is that we keep exploring as artists. And actually, there's another thing I want to say about that. When people are starting out within this, this realm of photography, cinematography, uh, marketing even, it is actually a good thing. Because the more people know how it works, the more you know, collective consciousness there is, you know, in, in, in towards, you know, like, well, we may, we may have to, at some point, change something. We need to, you know, steer the, this process in a different way. Uh, I have respect for everyone in that sense, you know, I have respect, respect for 
the people who make news. I have respect for those who make commercials. I've done the same thing. But it is important that they go deeper. That is a very important thing. So don't ever stop exploring and learning more and you know being curious about like, well, this works, but why does it work? You know, and this is a this is a something that I've 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 realized that even when I was doing my my teacher's degree in the Netherlands, I felt like, well, why don't they go any deeper than this? Like, okay, that's cool. This is like a huge part of psychology, but they never went into attention mechanism, which happens to be the key for learning, as well. And this is the thing you know like the more this is a really cool thing by the way in my manifesto i'm talking about well everybody can do photography now and you know it's 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 happening way too fast but when people start loving this medium whether it's photography or cinematography or whatever they start digging into the the the, the real context that you know the juicy stuff the the philosophy of it the psychology of it the neurology of it the metaphysics of it even because this is another thing, you know, this is maybe, uh, uh, this is old news by now, but a lot, still a lot of people don't realize this. Since 1920, we have this uh, double slit experiment. Anybody have heard of that? I don't know. Uh, so it's quantum physics. Yeah. And quantum physics is, uh, is a really cool thing. It goes into metaphysics, basically. And in this way, I, I'll just give you a very short uh, idea of why is it really cool. You can change whether uh, light manifests itself as a wave or as a particle by mere attention. Now think about, about that. You know, you were talking about like physics of light. We realize actually we are well. That means we don't understand nothing about light because there's a lot of things you know that are incomplete. How is this possible? They've been trying to do this experiment over and over and again trying to introduce new aspects to it, like to make sure it's not uh, a wrong way, that they're not doing something wrong, for a hundred years now. And they get the same result over and over and over again. You introduce, uh, you know, attention to it, and the waveform collapses into a particle, to a, a single uh, photon. Going back to Plato, you had Plato on one side, and you had Aristotle on the other. It is because of Aristotle that we have materialism. We have the whole idea of, you know, cosmology is based on it. Everything is based on materialism. And now you have this quantum uh, ex uh, physics, uh, which is for 100 years have been trying to solve a problem and can't because they're thinking out of materialism anyway. And, well, it's just like... And we're not even talking about the rest of the spectrum. So it's like, well, if that's just visible light, well, they're, they're, they're testing, they're, they're, they're testing uh, with a laser uh, within the, you know, the visible uh, uh, spectrum. They are testing this, you know, with uh, other wavelengths and they get the same thing, you know. So, okay, it's just mind boggling. It is, it, is, it is enough to, you know, destroy your whole worldview. It's just, if you're talking about catharsis, you know, this is the thing that actually uh, blew my mind. And this was, you know, this was just two years ago because I thought, oh, I, I know so much about light. And then I see this thing and I'm starting searching, well, this must be, this must be bullshit. This, this must be, you know, incorrect. And there's a, over a hundred years of, you know, people of trying, you know, different ways, different, it's an amazing thing, the double slit experiment uh, within the quantum physics realm. There is a lot of, you know, simpler explanations about it, but whichever way you look at it, it's just, it's like, okay, so go back two and a half thousand years ago, go back to Aristotle and, Pla and Plato, and then go with Plato, see where you come out. See, so it's like that, that's how amazing attention is and coupled with light, you get a, a totally different outcome. And I'm not talking about anything weird. This is mainstream science, mainstream science. <laughs> and how do you bring these ideas into your uh, photographic work? Well, within the, the, the quantum physics, I, 
I still don't. I still can't. I mean, I don't understand this. I do understand that attention is very important for us okay. in terms of, you know, what is flow? What is photographic flow? You go through a street, you know, you just, you made, uh, you made some really cool pictures. It didn't cost you any effort. You know, you, and you, and after a whole day of that, you all will be tired, but you come back, you're so satisfied. Oh, this, this has been amazing, you know. Same thing, you know, as, as you've been working and you've been working with a lot of focus and just time disappears. Yeah. Attention becomes more important than time. Well, you, we always hear like, okay, well, time is money. And I'd say, well, where is attention in that? Because think about this, you're trying to make a product, right? With attention and time, you get a good product. With just time, but no attention, no matter how much time you put into it, eh, it's not going to be much. Would you like to show us a little bit of your work? Uh, yes, this is a, a new thing for me, by the way, this, this whole program. So I hope this goes well. It's, uh... I have, can you see? Okay, cool, you can see this. So this uh, eight or nine years ago, this is a fourth version of the same camera. Uh, so the first version was much less um, rigid and it had a different camera on the back here. Everybody can see this, right? Yeah. The, uh, the mouse as well. Uh, this is the fourth version. This is 2014, I guess. Uh, let's see if I can see this. 2000, this is resaved. Where was the original? 2015. So uh, why? This is basically through the viewfinder photography. I have adapted this lens to make a very close focus, even though it had macro uh, function, uh, which is quite easy. You just have to unscrew, uh, partially unscrew the front element and voila, you can focus really, really close. So that's a trick for some. Uh, if you, uh, so this camera still works. It's in the Netherlands right now. But it still works on a, you could use it for film. Uh, so that's basically where it started. This is one of the other things. You can make things very simple when you're shooting video and you're stabilizing. You just use your neck, uh, the string, and this in your hand. And the left hand goes either on the ND filter or the focus ring. And there you go. Uh, I'm not going to show all the things because a there's a lot. So I had to do a lot of things on the budget. So I had to like come up with some you know, ways to do this. This is uh, the first TTF camera. This is through the Fresnel uh, camera that I've made. So this was the idea I was talking about. So you need to extend the whole line, make sure it's in the right height, and then uh, create you know an air uh, a light tight um, space for it. So there is a lot of, uh, I'll show you quickly what kind of uh, pictures that camera makes. And this is one of my favorites. I'm not sure if you can see it full screen. I think that's up to you. Yeah, we're, we have it in full screen. Yeah, so again, why this camera? Because it gave me the depth, the, the real like, uh, not, not just the, the process, but also this depth of being, you know, in there. I am in this this image and it's not, Photoshop. The only thing has been done to it right now is make it smaller and rotate it because everything is recorded upside down. Other than that, it doesn't have any uh, post-processing. Here you can see a lot of uh, scratches. So this is with the right kind of light, you, you, you get a lot of uh, scratches on, the, uh, on this matter. And you just basically... Uh, well, it's, it's, it's a bit of like a uh, naturalistic uh, photography back in the day, which is a lot of inspiration. Uh, you can also do this at night, take a longer exposure, but like because there's a lot of light, you need a lot of light for this. And you also need a strong back because you're carrying 10 kilograms. And I do not always want to carry it. So back in Europe, I did this. So here you see the, the, the console, the, the monorail, and here the tripod. And you just ride around. Sometimes you end up in a forest, sometimes you end up wherever. Uh, after that, I, you know, I was also very obsessed. I'm not sure if the video will work. Well, let's not do the 
audio then, but uh, I don't know. Can you see this? Can you see this changing, or is this too much for the connection? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so watch this. This is light. This is not photoshopped. So what happened there? That now I. So I was experimenting with multi-lens cameras, and actually this this thing behind me it's uh it's it's going there at some point. I still haven't figured out some of the things, uh, but I also don't have a lot of tools right now. So you've seen how the image just basically appears, disappears. Uh, when I was doing that, I also like I was already thinking like what to do with this. Uh, um, so this is uh, the first scanner camera. What it is consisting of is a tripod that goes horizontal. That becomes the focus mechanism, a very simple lens, which is basically uh, this. Very, very simple, a single element and two plates, and that's about it. Uh, what kind of work was that? So here's a, a scanning process uh, that is also rotated so this is already upside down because I see it uh, I see it 180 degrees from here so this is in Mexico last year so we measure the light I'm satisfied with the light and then uh, and then I just scan and where I stop or start uh, I determine my aspect ratio for example I'm not sure if you can still hear me I hope you do but yeah we're okay we are there. yeah so that was a picture that was a that was a scan taken and what comes out of those it looks like uh, looks like this so let's say I have a, a person that uh, walked through this the image that's what you get and you know this this could be a, you know a mistake this could also be something that you uh, do on purpose this is Santa Teresita, by the way. This is Guadalajara. Uh, maybe somebody has seen this uh, statue there on top of the market. Whenever you go and really uh, think of, you know, okay, what is flow? Uh, so this became a very interesting thing for me. So flow became an obsession. Like I, now I wanted to have uh, just the people who do something with flow. So what you see here is a person playing a, a, a contrabass. And while she's playing that, my hand goes along with the rhythm over this back screen. And this is what you get. Can you still hear me? Yes. Just checking because I have no idea if somebody's waving at me frantically and... We are amazed. Okay, so... It's too much to grasp. Sorry, this is... I know, and it is and it's, it's actually not that much time as well, so it is, it is a lot of things. So this, this flow um, was all about attention and it's like, uh, like in the description there is this, this thing where you have attention to the power of two uh, times uh, the time means flow. And what is attention to the times of two? It is focus. It is real focus when you're really concentrating on something. So just going to show you quickly what that looked like. So what you just saw the image it's made like this and when you see you see the image back you, you basically see the rhythm of the music while you cannot hear anything because it's a single image so I, I somehow ended up you know in between the um, uh, in between film and photography and, and another, just another quick thing. Uh, I came to Mexico. I had, I had some tools, but not much. I found some, some stuff on the market. This thing uh, was some wood that was uh, in the house, and this was during lockdown. So uh, I made this for my wife. I made this. Uh, this is uh, basically same idea as behind me. You had a Fresnel, which you can focus. Uh, but this Fresnel, uh, then uh, the image has been uh, reversed, uh, flipped uh, upside down. So you get a right way up image here. Yeah. And then you can use that to draw. So you have to find either a, a darker spot or use a, a cover. This is what it looks like through there. 
So this is just filmed with a mobile phone. This is the, during testing. And what you see now is a, is a uh, tracing paper on top of this screen. And now it, it's like any other camera. So if I want to make a scan through here, I could. Uh, but it's less, uh, less sharp. So here I'm trying out the, the focus mechanism. Uh, and this is what it looks like in a better way. And here I just use the tripod as a tent, so I could just basically sit down and uh, not have the sun burning on my uh, on my back. Uh, yeah, and oh yeah, there's uh, some other stuff that I there's some videos on my website. You should look at those. But um, what I was really looking for is I wanted to really slow people down on the street. I w didn't want to cre um, print pictures even. I wanted to show them on the street. So I started making this kind of stuff. This is basically a huge camera. <laughs> and what you do, wow. if I could just... Uh, so you have like multiple images of the same scene. It is curved a little bit, which is a, a help. Hold on one second. Where I find the right, the right stuff. Where is it? Ah, of course. Uh, no, this is the wrong one. So what happens is this, you, you roll this thing around with you, it's on wheels, you put it down somewhere and then you start hanging this, uh, this basically pieces of steel with a hook on it and you have a tripod idea and on this tripod you can just use the basically different points and different focus points. So the di of course the, they all have different focal lengths and, and different uh, um, uh, what's the word I just used it ah uh, image circles and with that you can just uh, play around and you can create your own image and uh, when you do that you take a really long time to do this and sometimes you're just not satisfied so you start over again right and while you're doing that people are passing by they're seeing this weird thing this, what the hell is this thing like, what, why is this? What, what is this crazy dude behind it? And they start looking at something. They see this. And only then do they um, realize, well, it's, it's, it's reality. It's something that I can see with my own eyes. So what I, what I was doing here, like, just basically trying to see something out of, you know, it's not, nothing out of the ordinary, is it? It's just normal thing. Right? It's, it can be something like this as well. And many photographers will understand what I'm talking about. It's like you, 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 you're walking by, you're thinking, wow, this, this place, this, this, this image is amazing. Right? We have a question. So you make ordinary things extraordinary because of the, of, because of the process? That's the goal? If the process is um, the viewer's process, yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, I try to slow people down to the point where they just become amazed by this ordinary thing. More uh, like you know, it's more like an experience, not, yes. not, but not because of the transformation of an ordinary thing into an extraordinary thing. Exactly. So in, in, a, in a sense of the scans, I would really want to be part of the process. But in a sense of this installation work, I really want it to be there and then. I don't want it to be afterwards, you know, uh, on, on, on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's almost a... Um, I wouldn't say it's a conflict, but there is a, almost like a... What's the word? Uh, unwillingness of taking pictures at that point so because now I am just there to experience the world and I want others to join me and I'm sure you know like a lot of people here would probably realize like they sometimes have this feeling like well I just want to grab somebody by the hand put them in the right spot and just to tell them like look at this look at this image with your own eyes you don't need your phone you don't need a, a camera you don't need you know you don't need anything, you just use these. 
So would you consider that, you know, Martes always says that there are three characters, you know, in the picture, the one who takes it, the one who's sitting and the one who's watching. So this experience takes out, you know, basically the one who's taking the picture and it becomes a personal experience for the one who's watching it. So you think it's even more uh, real than an actual photograph? photograph? I think uh, I think in a in a sense yes I think it's a uh, it is uh, maybe a framing reality, but with this inter um, interactive way where you can use not just your eyes but all of the senses. So I'm, I'm instead of going into like for example virtual reality where you are in control as well, but somebody else created this uh, experience for you, right? You cannot step out of that experience. Uh, and here you can, because you can just say, well, dude, move this, this, this camera out of the way. Now I really want to look at this. And then I'll say, sure, that's great, because now I have achieved something I really want. But this is a really interesting way of looking at it. and that, that, I've never heard of that before. So, yeah, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm, maybe I'm all, all over the place, but uh, I guess I, I'm trying to stay within... Um, the realm of light, basically. You, you keep all my attention. I, I, I try to see everything is a beautiful feeling of uh, realism uh, where, where I can see everything like three dimensional. It's not like shooting with 35 millimeters. Um, do you think uh, to, keep it, to keep people attention, you have to use this ultra large format? Or could you use uh, 35 millimeters or any other format? No, you don't have to do that. Um, the reason why I did that was because I really wanted, you know, to, to create this depth. I wanted to be part of the process. But uh, I, I, I often thought about, you know, this as well. Like, do I need to have this, um, you know, a cathartic feeling of, you know, of the large format? And, um, of course, people like something new. So that's maybe an aspect here, because they have never seen this. They look at this and they think, wow, you know, and what if I don't have the depth of, of field there, you know, which is really something nice? Um, would it still work? I think it would, uh, because it is, again, it is. I think this is where you come back to the to the attention mechanism. If you know what it is, you will make sure that you slow down. And a lot of people don't know what it is, but yet they will look at a picture for a long time. They will look at a film for a long time and over and over and over again until they really think, well, now I really understand what uh, the director and the, the director of photography really wanted to tell me. You know, so... Um, for that, you do need to explore this this subject. You need to really go into the you know what happens with your head, what happens you know. You need to know a bit of storytelling, but that's a start. It's it's just you have to start somewhere. I mean, I I've been photographing for almost twenty years now, so I need I needed to start somewhere, and I started as a sports photographer. And the thing that, that, that they taught me first was this, you know, like if you're making a portrait of somebody, make sure that there is not a, a light pole sticking out of their head in the background. You know, it was as simple as that. Because I was, I was thinking about the cameras. I mean, the format of the cameras, uh, the smallest ones, Leica, uh, SLRs, Reflex, or, or these cameras that are really simple to get through and just shut the moment um they are pretty easy and fast cameras yeah. but your camera you have you need time to put the tripod to establish the position of your camera to decide the focus so i understand the process um requires attention a lot of attention i i don't i'm not saying that 35 millimeters don't need attention it needs but um but some cameras are really faster than others. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's why I was thinking, maybe, maybe this, uh, this contribution of, 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 of paying attention to the process contributes to make another kind of photography that 
obligate the people to, to see with attention? Well, mm, I, I, see the, I see the advantages of the small cameras. And actually, sometimes I miss them. Mm. I, I see another hand, by the way. I'll, I'll, uh, David raised the hand. But let me just answer this really quick. Uh, or maybe not too quick, but there is an interesting ha thing happening. When you walk around with this thing, you get a lot of attention. Once you put it down and you cover yourself up, you still disappear. Now all of a sudden people walk by and they don't really care for, oh, there's something there, you know, like I don't care, I'm busy, you know. So it could work for street photography as well as, as a small camera. Yet I like the small cameras because it is really uh, when you are struggling with you know, having this creative flow that an easy, an easy and small camera is actually much, much better choice than this thing. This thing allows you to um, to be absorbed in, you know, in in this image, but it is very different uh, uh, process when, for example, you are going out and you want to make a picture. You are actually pushing yourself into making a picture you're trying to make this effort you're forcing yourself into it which makes sure that you're not going to make anything that you like because now you're actually like you're, you're stopping your own uh, creative flow take a small easy camera and then you can uh it's not about amount either but it's like you just see something that happens you know for maybe 10 seconds you know that's just a scene on the street you just happen to walk by and bam and you have a really really cool image you have something that you are probably amazed yourself you know with this image when you're looking back at it like well i knew it was a cool thing to photograph but now it came out like wow you know so small cameras i like them because they are discreet and they have this very different flow to them and i i don't think i've answered your question uh, like fully but I have to think about it more. There's David uh, still with a raise, raised hand. I am. I just want to. I don't. I don't think this is. It's a question. I'm just trying trying to absorb everything that you have said, because what I like uh, about the approach you, you you take with with this kind of photography is that somehow you're you're. Um, the final image is not the the goal here, but a, a reflection on what you were doing. The, the thing I'm, I'm, I'm the things that I've been thinking with this is that all these years there has been put a lot of money and technology to make the act of observing simple and fast and easy to sell because the act of seeing became a product and I, that's I, why I, we're, we're, we're selling like uh, faster cameras and high resolution and simpler ways to get the photo you want. No, there is a lot, uh, there's, uh, I mean, continue if you, uh, uh, and, uh, you, you can interrupt. I mean, I'm, I'm just throwing thoughts here. Yeah, uh, which is great. Um, first of all, I think there is uh, it, what you said in the beginning. Uh, that part, yeah, it has a lot of merit because it's, uh, I think for me, process maybe is more important than the product itself. Although, um, you know, I, I am proud of what I make, you know, and sometimes I'm less proud of what I make. So definitely the, the, the end product counts. So maybe it's like 50-50. Uh, although sometimes, like I said, I, I go out and I return with no images at all, but I have looked through it and then I decided, well, I'm not going to make it, but this just looks beautiful. And another thing is what you're saying. Uh, that's That one is uh, much harder to, uh, I, I, guess it, I guess, even to put in words, but... Um, technology is a good thing and this faster and you know better uh, is, 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 is on the one hand 
something that technology does. It, it can only accelerate. It can only go ever so faster, and we cannot keep up with it. So this is a, is a big aspect to that. So you have the technology and just basically disconnects from what we want, maybe what we need. You know, I, I can imagine that if you if you have, if your camera does twenty frames a second and you are a sports photographer you you need that it's really nice it's it gives you a, it it relieves you of stress when you are out there and actually making pictures if the out of focus is so quick that you know you you're you're always sure that it's going to catch somebody not just by their head but maybe by their eye you know that's that's awesome because that that can relieve you of stress when you need to produce um but then comes you know the the other photographer, the more artistic one. And for them, I would say, just go your own way. And this is uh, something that, you know, once you, uh, once you try out some things, you realize, well, this works for me, and then just go that way. There is nothing that you have to do. It's like, in Dutch, there's a cool saying, nix moot, nothing must, literally. It, it, there is no... Go your own way. This is what I did. I go, went my own way because I, I needed something. So I needed to create it in the first place. And then, yes, you're right. It is absolutely more about the process because building this camera, you know, was part of it. Building the other cameras was part of it. Building these installations was part of it. Yeah, and that's, what, that's why I was amazed by, by this because um, when I started doing photography, I started with digital. And um, I put all this work to get always the, the, the perfect photo, like the right exposure, the focus on spot. And when I started uh, with film, um, it felt, I felt in peace because somehow I let go yeah. perfection. And I put myself through the process of being sensitive to the moment because also I only have 35 takes and what what am I gonna photograph with them uh, yeah. so I, I I put myself through the process to think and to be sensitive about the moment not not only just taking amazing pictures and this is a step way further because it's it's like uh, to You're... think to think the process of seeing Yes, you're, you're learning to see first and then you're learning the technical aspects later. And this has been somewhat reversed because um, I guess you have, you have the, so much more power to correct things afterwards. Yeah. This creates less pressure as well in, 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 in a way, but also uh, like kind of slows down this, this process of really looking at things. Um, there's... Um, there's an interesting thing happening when you have this, um, you, your knowledge grows, right? In a specific way uh, about photography. And as it grows, you start being more and more perfectionistic. So you're, you're, you're creating this, uh, uh, this pressure on yourself, you know, and with digital photography, we see that um, a lot because people start checking their pictures while they're, you know, they're, they're making them and forget to actually look at the scene in front of them. So they, they, they start looking at the back screen of the camera, which is good as well, but in the first place, they have not really checked the, the, the scene in front of them. So I, I'm, I'm making things very black and white here. You know, I, I'm trying to, but it's very nuanced. It's, there is a lot of context to it. The thing is this, the more of that knowledge you have, the more perfectionistic you're going to get to the point where it's going to block you. Where, to the point where it's going to be something that you're trying to do something and then this voice in the back of your head is telling you, well, this is not by the book. You're not supposed to do that. You know, and uh, maybe when you, when you go back to analog photography where you cannot see your image straight away, you are more in the process of just problem solving. You are not concerned with, you know, well, you are concerned with outcome, but you are not concerned of it at, at, at the same way. You're not looking at this back image and really looking for details. Maybe you're looking more at it in, as a whole, you know? 
So maybe that's paraphrasing what you said, but I, I think I understand you. I have had some experience with some uh, students that they are very concerned about technology, about what kind of camera you have, what kind of lenses, everything about this. But um, I've seen that schools are not interested in teaching uh, the first part of photography, which is observation. No, to uh, yeah. I said perfection blocks. I mean, in, in some moment you will know everything you can have in your hands, and after that, what? No, and if you are aware about reality, about the things that happens in the day to day, you will be able to mm, to flow into experimental things into observation, into attention? Do you think we, we, we are having problems about teaching? Should we come back into observation first? Uh, well, to that last thing, definitely yes. Why? Because it is, um, it is the key that you know the motivation behind the image you want to make. Okay. So when you have the motivation as in, you know, I have observed something, I know why it interests me, and now I want to know technologically how to make this image. You know, and once again, I am not against technology, I love technology as well, because it allows us, you know, I, I can only make this, this camera because there's, you know, technology of plastics, there's technology of many, many different things that allows me to do this, even the scanner, you know. Uh, when I was teaching, there was the same problem. We, uh, the school that I worked, they spent yearly 100,000 euros on new cameras. Now, you might, you might think that's a lot. Well, it's not. It's, you know, if you buy two or three uh, ENG cameras, you know, that's 20,000 euros, 30,000 euros, you know, or more. And there goes your money. But then they had, uh, the classes should be smaller, so they had to hire. They they really needed to hire an extra teacher for that. So then the feedback becomes more important, you know, to actually see the pattern of what your student is doing, you know, and then asking him the right questions. And then the student has this, this catharsis moment, like, oh man, I've been photographing the same thing over and over again. I wasn't even realizing this. And then he, that student can go on into details and think, okay, well, if this subject interests me so much, I'm going to follow the subject voila, you have motivation and you have a happy student that now wants to learn everything about, you know, who done what with this subject, uh, how, what technology have they been using, uh, just goes by itself, you have a happy student, which is great, like this is the, the thing you really, really want. Um, where, it, where it comes from, this, this technological, uh, uh, like technology first, I think it's our society because we're 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 putting so much emphasis towards it. We're also putting a lot of emphasis towards uh, uh, idealiz idealization. Uh, so these new cameras they provide you a means of achieving that. So again, this camera with twenty frames a second can capture you you know the the best smile you know. So not too much, not not too little, you know. Maybe the eyes were closed you know half a second before, but you know, on frame 19, you know, the eyes are perfect, you know. So now I have my perfect image, you know, and this technology allowed me to, to get this. And, uh, but maybe you will come back with a film camera and you've been shooting, uh, you know, with an older Minolta that has a pre-flash to measure the light. So which causes everybody to close their eyes, you know, at some point. So now you have your roll of, roll of film, you've been shooting, you know, with a with flash, and you come back and all your pictures are like with, with people with eyes closed. You know, so there's this, uh, again, there's, there's not really black and white thing, but idealization and uh, this, this faster, faster, faster definitely counts. So uh, we, as teachers, I think we should really push back uh, because we should not forget why we are making images. Observation is the key of your motivations, and that's a great, a great thing to keep in mind, to keep in our heart. Um, 
Does anybody wants to make any question? We have some, maybe a little bit more minutes, but you should, you should make some questions to this guy. Uh, I like questions. <laughs> Edgar, welcome. Hi. Um, Hi. About the content, the human being, the psychology, uh, about uh, be part of the photography, but here in Mexico, how Mexican culture uh, has influenced in your artistic creativity, in your artistic development? Well, first of all, I think that Mexicans are uh, in a better spot right now because they have still their... Um, there, there is a very big split in Mexico. You have you know, the fast and you know, uh, modern and you have the traditional and slow, you know, by hand. And this is something I really, really like. And uh, actually, I would really love to go around Mexico and just photograph uh, or rather scan those hand processes. So people who are we uh, weaving a, a basket, for example, or you know, uh, making a what's what do you call this uh, uh, en en embroidery, right? Uh, those things, you know, just the hand movements and their concentration. That would have been, you know, that would be a perfect uh, subject for me. And uh, I really have to learn Spanish, you know, and then I could do that. So uh, this, this, this maybe is the biggest influence at this point. And I'm, I'm also starting to explore the Mexican artists. I'm starting to explore the Mexican uh, history, uh, which is something really amazing. And talking about metaphysics again, uh, Mexico has a lot of that. And this is another uh, big, big aspect, which still is, well, I, I, there's, there's always more to explore in there. You know, uh, I'm, I'm already doing, I'm really interested in this aspect in, in this day and age, uh, because it's, it's crazy times and we are trying to find out who we really are. And yeah, I guess Mexico has a lot of uh, a lot to offer in those subjects. Finally, dear Maxim, I have a question. What do you think about innovation? Because your work uh, obviously is swimming into innovation. Um, uh, what I think is that there is a big relation with your idea of attention, of being free, of being happy. You know, I think uh, there is no innovation when there is censorship um, when there is censorship um, our ideas can let flow freely so what's your idea about innovation are you doing this thing right now with your work I think so uh, but it is an innovation that uh, I guess it's 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 where you put your own goals so innovation is just like creativity uh, you know is the process and innovation is the product it's a very human thing. It's, it's actually one of the key things that you know differentiates us from you know animals. Uh, like, if you want to look at the details of how that works, I, then again, the attention mechanism is the place to be. But creativity is so much more than just you know making something with your hands or you know uh, creating images. It is basically problem-solving skills. Okay. It is looking at your own self, learning about your own self, and then applying uh, that knowledge uh, at a problem, or maybe during communication. So let's say, you know, I want to tell you something very, very, uh, very, very com complicated. I would need to find a way to, to do that. So again, a problem-solving skill. Um, there's a thing uh, with censorship. It is happening. I would agree, definitely. And it is also a, a reason to apply creativity. So the rules I made, for example, within my, my manifesto were to limit myself. And out of that limitation came that, that thing, eventually. So, uh, think of this. This is a very interesting thing again. 
If you go on YouTube, you look uh, in English, you look for a crow solving a problem, a crow uh, solving uh, a multiple step problem. You realize that intelligence is creativity, intelligence is problem solving, because you see this crow going step by step, solving different problems with this, using a stick, so using an instrument even, you know, to get to food. Now, you go back to evolutionary, uh, uh, evolutionary um, psychology and then you encounter something as, a, as an ape uh, taking a stick and then hitting a banana uh, on the tree to get to it. So it can not climb the tree for some reason, so then it gets a stick and then, voila, you have food, right? And here we are right now talking about photographies, right? So it's like uh, innovation is, is, is really part of us. It's, it's, it's what we do. And uh, again, uh, we really need to know how to deal with it rather than, you know, rather than to, to say, no, it's a bad thing. Yeah. Manuel Torres wants to make your question. I want to know if you will have an exhibition Guadalajara. Uh, so I understood this. Um, whether I would have a um, an expo in Guadalajara? Yes. Uh, I would like to, but I at this point I don't have a you know like a lead for that. There was a there's a bit of a plan for uh, La Jacaranda in uh, in uh, Pascuaro. Uh, that's the only lead at this point. Uh, first of all, I need to find a good place to print, and I think I found. Uh, a good one for that is uh, Ricardo Guzman and he has actually done a few test prints which I haven't seen yet and uh, I'm, I'm really curious about that so uh, maybe uh, in a bit of time uh, once I know you know like where to print like uh, probably it's going to be Ricardo because from what I've heard it was it was a good thing what what he had um, so I need a place and I need a time and then I'll get to work. So yes, I would like to show my pictures, you know, on paper and, uh, in terms of installation right now, I don't have anything here, but I do have ideas. So it's just a matter of time until I also have that aspect of my work. We want to see your prints. I, I, I would really like to show to see it. And, uh, I, I'm pro soon you will have so we'll be in touch so you can where we see that the last question is i will repeat are you photograph will photographs photograph be in large format big yes large that, format? so uh, i usually print uh so in the netherlands i print the the, the cameras that that have a, a second camera behind it those prints would be A2, so that's like, uh, you don't use this in, uh, no, in Mexico, that's, that's another, uh, so it's just quite a large format, so think of a 50 by 70, a uh, poster size, 40 by 60, or that, that size, and um, the other pictures, the, the scans, they are large rolls, so what I basically do there is I determine the, the, the width, which is usually 25 centimeters. And then the length is as is, you know, because you, you just, uh, the, the length differs enormously. Some of them, they may be, you know, in almost the same aspect ratio as the screen of the computer, 16 to 9 or uh, 16 to 10. And others are just, they go from the, from the ceiling to the ground, to the, to the floor. And that really depends on, you know, like, okay, if, if, the, if, the, if the wall is three meters high, then I could go three meter uh, tall. But then it's, it creates another problem. How do I see well enough what's up there? Yeah. I can't. So then you, what do you do? Like put a, put, a, uh, put a letter next to it or do you print smaller? Ricardo wants to say something. Thank you Welcome, Ricardo. I have a, a, not a question. Just when should we meet we all? Let's 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 do something. Let's do some, that some yeah. workshop with you and, and let know these guys that we are working to 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 get the workshop done. Well, that was, that, that was my next question. What about um, uh, your next workshop? It's going to be here in Guadalajara, in Foz. Are you um, 
Are you preparing something? Yes, I am actually. I'm, uh, I'm not just translating, but also modifying uh, a course that I gave in the Netherlands. Uh, I gave this course the first time was, I think, a year and a half, almost two years ago. No, it, yeah, two years ago. And uh, this is, course is about understanding what creativity really is. It goes into what attention mechanism really is and how the two are connected. So how do you become, um, uh, if you're blocked, how to become unblocked? If you have this pressure, you know, like I need to perform always, you know, and it blocks you. This is primarily for, for those kind of people. But even if you do uh, have your creative flow ongoing, it's also good to re, uh, um, reanalyze, re, uh, uh, look again at what you are doing. So what happens is that you usually end up seeing a red line. You see, you see a line goes through your whole career. If you look for images, you know, you made 10 years ago, you might find that your compositions are exactly the same. Yeah. You know, I found this out because I, I, I made this course and then one of the students that was doing the course, we were at the, at the last lesson and we were just looking now at my work as well. And he says, well, do you realize that you're also doing the same thing? And I'm like, well, probably, but what do you mean? And then he, he, he could tell me exactly like what my compositions are. And I, and I went home and I start looking and he was right. I've been doing the same thing all over, like over and over and over again. And it's, it's very interesting to see this, but it's also interesting to, to realize that, okay, uh, I, I made some changes in my process at some point. Why was that? So, uh, you know, you, you know how many uh, people are using art to express themselves, right? And art becomes really a mirror of, you know, what you are feeling. And this is a, this is a, a moment uh, of truth for yourself. When you look back at your own works, uh, Michal could, uh, could, for example, explain to me the other day, you know, at, at uh, some of his work, looking back, you know, well, there was emptiness. And this came from his feeling and he is, you know, he's, he's already there that he can talk about it as he can, you know, analyze this. Uh, but definitely not everybody sees the same thing. So it's very interesting to also look from other points. So it's practice, it's theory. And um, in the end, you understand yourself much better. You understand your own creativity much better and how your perception works. This is a very important thing. Well, hurry guys, up with guys. this curse. Yeah, come on, Ricardo. There are going to be only five places because it's going to be not online. It's going to be live. I want yeah. one place. Five places. <laughs> yes, five I places. I take one. <laughs> okay, six places. Michel, six places because it's going to be in, in this large classroom. So I, I, I think yeah. it could be six places plus Maxims. And maybe we could arrange and um, something larger like a large uh, talk you know well yeah and, and definitely we can repeat the course at some point totally. so it's not like yeah. it's it's totally. just totally. one time only so six places the the first six people that spits over the computer are <laughs> me. <laughs> no, six, me, please, me. six places it's, it's gonna be live covid free <laughs> COVID free for everyone. <laughs> we are looking forward to have this um, this course, Maxims. It must be really, really interesting. This this talk is really inspiring, really interesting totally. to, to to see that art is not only a, a, a beauty conception. No, um, it 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 comes from our heart. It comes from our motivations. It comes from another tools like attention observation like being in the present like have have something to talk about um if there is nobody else uh, that want to make a, a question um i would like to say thank you very much for this uh, beautiful talk we uh, we are expecting your course of course hurry up so i can i can study with you <laughs> before i go but uh thank you very much uh, uh, I'm really happy to have you here and welcome to Guadalajara. 
Thank you, and I'm 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 really glad that uh, you invited me because it's 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 great when um, it, you 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 come to the right crowd, you know. Yeah. You come to the right crowd who are all involved in in the same thing, and and I, that also means uh, like I really hope that this when it sinks in creates some really really difficult questions. Yeah. Because this means progress for me as well maybe you'll point me to something that i've you know like wow this is gonna be another chapter you know this is gonna be another amazing uh search and, and you're right one last thing art is very very important it is something that time and time again is the first thing to uh be um uh, crushed you know in culture Whenever there is like, a, oh, we don't have enough money, art is the first one to go. And this is, I can go on for like for forever, why is this is a bad thing? Absolutely. Well, um, again, thank you very much. Uh, thank you everyone to be here. Um, this was our first experience in English. I think we did it well. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> See you next week in Charlemos Sobre Fotografía. Uh, thank you very much for being here. And uh, have a great night. Thank you again, Maxim, and welcome You're to welcome. this city. Thanks so much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you Good very night. Much.